Hey guys, so welcome back to another lecture video for Chem 104. Before we start, I want to congratulate every single one of you for uh, finishing up um, and making it through the general chemistry portion of this course. And so we're going to finally move into the organic and biochemistry portion of this course, which I hope you guys will find um, interesting and, and fun. And so to introduce this new section, we're going to start by learning what organic chemistry is and how to represent organic molecules. So that by the end of this uh, lecture series for this chapter, you guys will understand what, this, what these stick figure drawings that I've drawn on either ends of the title represent. All right, so let's go ahead and start. So organic chemistry is a very specific field in chemistry that deals with a study of uh, hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons are carbon-based or carbon-containing compounds that is mostly composed of carbons and, and hydrogen. That's why it's called hydrocarbons. And so this field in chemistry, organic chemistry, deals with uh, the study of the structure of hydrocarbons, the properties of hydrocarbons, uh, the reactions of hydrocarbons, and the preparations of hydrocarbons or carbon-containing compounds. And so you guys have encountered organic molecules or these hydrocarbons on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, if you like to eat food um, or cook, all of those substances um, are carbon-based, they are carbon-containing compounds, and most of them uh, are hydrocarbons. And so if you like to work out, the protein supplements you ingest is also carbon-based. Um, if you are working towards a career in healthcare, all of the drugs that, were, that are prescribed by the doctor and distributed by the pharmacist um, and ingested by the patients were either the products of an organic chemical reaction or the products of a bio-organic chemical reaction. Um, other places in industry where organic chemistry is prevalent is uh, the production of rubber, biofuels, and plastics. And that's just a short list of applications. Um, so overall, since you know, organic, organic compounds play a strong uh, role in our daily life, it really highlights the importance of studying this field um, deeply. And so I did mention that carbon, uh, the hydrocarbons are primarily composed of carbons and hydrogens. There are other elements that's present in these hydrocarbons or carbon-containing compounds, such as oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, or halogen. And so all of these elements since they don't fall under, you know, what we canonically think uh, of hydrocarbons, like the word hydrocarbons, carbons and hydrogens, we're going to go ahead and refer to these elements as heteroatoms. And so these heteroatoms, they do play a strong role in the chemical and physical properties of these organic compounds. They can either increase the solubility of organic compounds or decrease its solubility in solution. Um, so that could have an effect in either industry or, for example, drug delivery. Um, so these, these heteroatoms also provide a specific uh, reactive nature to organic compounds. And we'll, look, uh, we'll take a look at organic reactions as we progress through this chapter. And the list continues. And so these heteroatoms are actually really, really important um, with respect to you know, structural properties, physical properties, chemical properties of these organic compounds. All right, and so before we start learning how to depict um, these organic compounds on, on paper, we need to revisit Lewis structures and uh, Lewis dot structures and, and the octet rule. Um, 
And the, the Lewis dot structure and the octet rule and the number of covalent bonds is really, really important for us to understand because it sets the foundation of how we're supposed to draw these organic compounds on paper. And so uh, if you guys recall valence electrons or V dot E dot, um, so that's my abbreviation for valence electrons, they are electrons that's found on the outermost shell. And so the bonding of organic molecules is typically through covalent bonds. So we're no longer gonna deal or work with ionic bonds. So ionic bonds was for general chemistry. Um, and so since we're dealing with covalent bonds, we're talking about sharing electrons. And the main purpose of sharing these electrons is, to, is for that, that element or that atom to gain some electronic stability. If you guys recall from uh, the general chemistry portion of this course, uh, one way that we can assess the stability, electronic stability of an element, is whether or not they fulfill the octet rule, uh, such that the number of valence electrons on its outermost shell is eight, right? And so um, if you guys look at the periodic table, you're going to be using the group number for the main group elements to help you uh, determine how many valence electrons there, there is present on a specific element. So if you look at carbon, carbon falls under the group 4A. Um, remember, remember these are the main group elements, so we're not looking at transition elements. Uh, so once you hit, you know, like beryllium, then jump automatically to the boron family, right? And so since carbon falls under uh, 4A, it has four valence electrons on its outermost shell. Uh, for hydrogen, since it's group 1A, it will have one valence electron on its outermost shell. Uh, for nitrogen, um, if you guys are looking at the periodic table, it falls under group 5A in the periodic table, and so therefore it's going to have five valence electrons. Oxygen and sulfur, um, they're both under each other, so sulfur is underneath oxygen, and they are found in group 6A, and so therefore they're going to have six valence electrons. Um, halogens are found in group 7A on the periodic table, and so therefore they're going to have seven valence electrons. Okay. And so by knowing the number of valence electrons um, and comparing it to how much electrons it needs to fulfill the octet rule, it actually helps us determine the number of covalent bonds or the maximum number of covalent bonds that should be observed between two elements. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. And so uh, when you're translating these four valence electrons into Lewis dot structure, we're going to put one, two, three, four. Okay. For hydrogen, since it only has one, we're just gonna put one. And by the way, hydrogen doesn't fall under the octet rule, it falls under the duet rule. In other words, it only needs two valence electrons for its uh, valence shell to be full and therefore get that you know extra electronic stability. And so for nitrogen, since it has five valence electrons, we're going to put one electron up here, two, three, four, and five. And so once I place that fifth valence electron, notice how we create a lone pair. And so typically um, that lone pair stays together unless it's actually required for it to separate. Um, and we'll take a look at that later down the line when we're looking at chemical reactions. So for oxygen and sulfur, since they both have six valence electrons, we're gonna put one, two, three, four, 
five, six. Uh, and you'll see that there's two lone pairs on oxygen. So for sulfur, the same thing. You guys don't actually need to start at the very top, so you don't really need to start here. You can start at the bottom, left, right. But you just want to make sure that you distribute the number of electrons evenly on each side of that letter. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. And so here I can see that there are two lone pairs for sulfur. Now I'm just going to represent the halogen. Uh, so all of these will be depicted uh, for fluorine um, in terms of the Lewis dot structure. Uh, they're pretty much the same. The only thing that, that's different is the element itself. And so since it has seven valence electrons, I'm going to put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so here, um, notice that fluorine or any halogen will have three lone pairs and one electron that is unbound. Okay. All right. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and highlight these uh, electrons that do not that are not in a lone pair. Um, and so remember that these elements they want to achieve they want to have eight valence electrons on their outermost shell. So they want to fulfill that octet rule to get that um, electronic stability. And so um, if you guys are looking at carbon, notice that we have four valence electrons. And so we need four more valence electrons. And therefore, if we're talking about the, the number of bonds that a carbon needs to fulfill the octet rule, then it needs four more covalent bonds or just four covalent bonds. Okay. And so uh, you'll see that how these four covalent bonds are distributed will be different. So sometimes it can be all single bonds. Uh, sometimes you'll see a combination of single bonds and double bonds or single bonds and triple bonds. Okay. Now, if you guys are looking at hydrogen, uh, so we have one valence electron. Uh, and for, for it to fulfill its duet rule, you need one more valence electron. And so if you need one more valence electron, that's going to translate in one covalent bond. And so typically hydrogens only need one covalent bond. And uh, so if you guys are, are looking at this pattern, um, I don't want to like bore, bore you with this pattern, but um, so if you can just take this, this electron and just draw a line That's going to uh, depict how many covalent bonds that specific element can make or could make. Right? So here for nitrogen, I have one, two, three. Um, that's another way for you guys to kind of think about this. Uh, so for oxygen, since it has six valence electrons, and since two of them are not in a lone pair, uh, then that tells you that oxygen can bond two times. Same thing with sulfur, right? So for sulfur here we have one, two. So here we have one, two lone pairs and two covalent bonds. And yes, I am depicting um, the way that I'm drawing the two structures just to highlight or demonstrate that where the lone pairs are and where the, the bonds are located, uh, it's not gonna be fixed. And so remember that these um, organic compounds are three-dimensional in nature. And so since they're three-dimensional in nature, that means that we can kind of move them around each other on paper uh, as long as we're 
still representing the correct number of bonds and the correct number of lone pairs. And so finally, for fluorine or any halogen, notice that it only has one unpaired electron. And so therefore, it can only create one covalent bond, while the rest are lone pairs. Okay. Um, and so uh, we're, we're going to kind of need to keep, we need to keep all of this in the back of our mind especially when we're trying to depict these organic structures in different forms. Okay. And so the first representation that we're going to learn of how organic compounds can be written on paper is what's known as the expanded structure. And so the expanded structure is, uh, this is an example of an expanded structure. So notice that it shows um, the the connections so it shows the bonds and the bonds for all elements yeah. right so if we uh let's just say let's focus on this carbon right <clears throat> so this carbon is currently bonded to two hydrogens. And if you look to the left and the right of that carbon that I just highlighted in green, notice that it's covalently bonded to two more carbons. Um, however, if I were to, oh, actually, let me take that back and put that green back. Um, and so if you count the number of electrons that carbon either owns or uh, is being shared to carbon. We have one, two, three, four electrons that the carbon owns. But in terms of what's being shared, we have one, two, three, four. And so if you add up all the black dots and the orange dots, uh, that's going to give carbon the eight valence electrons that it needs to gain that stability. Okay. So there's um, a lot of things here, so I'm going to make sure to keep my drawings clean, um, <clears throat> just because I want to highlight some other features. And so let's go ahead and take a look at another carbon. Um, let's go ahead and take a, a look at this carbon right here. So notice that this carbon has one, two, three, four electrons that it owns because it's those electrons are pointed towards that carbon. And uh, once again, in maybe I'll do this in pink this time. Um, and since that line is connected to one, two, three, four other electrons, those four electrons in pink are being shared to the carbon that I've highlighted. And so if you count the total number, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the middle two gives me my seven, my eight. Okay. And so um, notice that it's still representing eight electrons on that carbon that I highlighted in green. Now, if I were to look at, for example, uh, this carbon, this carbon has and owns, uh, sorry, owns and shares one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So once again, it's fulfilling that octet rule. Now, if we look at another element besides carbon, such as nitrogen. Okay. So if we take a look at this nitrogen, remember nitrogen still needs that eight electron, eight valence electrons on its, on its valence shell. So here we have one, two that it owns, three, four, five that it owns, and then it's sharing one, two, three more electrons. So overall, that's eight electrons that nitrogen either shares 
or owns. Okay, so it's going to fulfill that octet rule. So um, if you're looking at hydrogen, it's just any hydrogens that you guys see. So for example, uh, this hydrogen right here that I'm highlighting in green, it has one electron that it owns, but it's also sharing one more electron to, with carbon. And so if I'm looking at it in, under this perspective, notice that hydrogen has two electrons. Um, whether it's shared or owned, uh, therefore fulfilling its duet rule. Okay. Um, another thing that I want to show you on the expanded structure is the, uh, the electron geometry and the molecular geometry that's depicted. And so if you guys recall, um, let's just go ahead and talk about the electron geometry or groups of electron. We have one, two, three groups of electron. And if you have three groups of electron, its bond angle is going to be approximately 120. Um, and so therefore, it's going to be trigonal planar. Okay. Whereas if you guys are looking at this carbon... Um, notice it has uh, one, two, three, four groups of electrons, and four groups of electrons represents the tetrahedral electron geometry. So that means the bond angle is going to be 109.5 degrees. Okay. If I were to take a look at the carbon uh, if I were to take a look at this carbon, notice that this carbon has one, two groups. Okay. And if you have two groups, then its electron geometry is linear. Okay. And therefore, its bond angle is going to be 180 degrees. Oops, not Celsius, just 180 degrees. Okay. Um, and so... I want you guys to go ahead and, and constantly keep this in mind. Actually, before I move on, I do want to do one oxygen. Uh, so that's a heteroatom that we'll constantly see over and over again. And so this oxygen has one, two, three, four groups of electrons. And so therefore, it's going to be tetrahedral in electron geometry. And in terms of molecular geometry, it would be bent. Okay. All right, and uh, so I want you guys to go ahead and perhaps, you know, like pause this video and try to identify the electron and molecular geometry for every single nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, oxygen, and phosphorus that you guys see. Okay, and so. Um, it's important for you guys to understand the, the bond angles because it's going to dictate on how we draw these uh, organic compounds on paper when we do the skeletal uh, notation. All right, and so long story short, the expanded structure just basically shows everything. It shows all the connections um, and uh, you know, somewhat the bond angles. Um, but, I mean, this is pretty much what you see for an expanded structure. Now, if you guys imagine, um, it takes a long time to draw these expanded structures. And so, you know, as chemists, we need to develop a way to represent the expanded structure uh, in a easier way um, without us without it taking up a lot of our time but it'll still contain all of the information that the expanded structure contains and so this is where the condensed structure comes in and so the condensed structure um, takes a look at the expanded structure and says okay uh, what can we take out and uh, 
what can we what bonds can we take out to still represent the connection between like the carbons and the hydrogens and the nitrogens and all of that stuff and so we're going to go ahead and go through uh, several examples of the condensed structure so we're going to go from the expanded to the condensed and so what you guys see is the expanded structure and then we're going to go ahead and depict this in the condensed uh, structure, the condensed form. Um, all right, and so when you when you guys are representing the condensed structure, uh, you want to look at patterns, right? And so let me zoom in here. And so the carbons on this condensed structure, oops. So the carbons on this uh, condensed structure serves as like the backbone. Yeah. And so what we're gonna do is that since these carbons are the backbone, uh, we're going to represent everything that's attached to that backbone um, as a chemical formula. And so uh, what do I mean by this? Since this carbon is a central atom, we're going to go ahead and summarize this portion of the expanded structure is simply CH3, okay? Because there's one carbon and three hydrogens. And you always want to write your uh, central atom first for that specific portion of the molecule. Okay. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and box this region of the expanded structure. And I'm going to summarize uh, this. Uh, I'm going to summarize what I box in red as another CH3. Um, and so what the condensed structure does is that it's removing all of these single bonds that's present in the molecule. And we're going to condense all of the atoms in a chemical formula type setting. Now when you bring these uh, two pieces together, notice that it's connected by a covalent bond right in the middle. But since we're getting rid of that single bond, that single covalent bond, um, we're going to go ahead and summarize it as simply CH3 and CH3. Okay. So notice that there is no, um, no single bonds shown. In addition, um, you guys will notice that uh, the link to the carbons, it's not like um, like H3CCH3. Okay. Notice that the link to these two carbons is kind of separated by the hydrogens. But you have to, when you guys are looking at the uh, condensed structure, you guys just have to kind of keep this in mind that, you know, the consecutive um, carbons are bonded to each other in such a way that they're kind of separated in the condensed structure. Okay. And so this is the condensed structure of this expanded um, molecule. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and, and work through another example. And so instead of working with just two carbons, we're going to work with three carbons, and we're going to learn how to uh, depict this in a condensed format. And so I'm going to go ahead and start by sectioning off 
this area. The reason why is because I see a carbon, a central carbon. And that central carbon is connected to three hydrogens and yes, another carbon. However, we can represent this specific section as simply CH3. And so um, I'm gonna do the next one, maybe I'll just do it in blue, just so that there's contrast. I'm gonna go ahead and depict this section of the expanded structure as simply CH2. And then la last but not least, I'm gonna go ahead and box this section in green. And oops, I'm going to represent this as CH3. And so when you put them together, remember um, all of these single bonds that connects the carbons together is separated by hydrogens in your condensed structure. Um, and so when you put all three of these together, you simply get CH3. CH2 and CH3. Okay. And so this would be the condensed structure for this expanded structure of this organic molecule. Okay. So hopefully um, by going through these two examples, uh, it kind of makes sense on how to go from expanded to the condensed structure. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at one more. So feel free to pause this video and kind of work it, uh, work it on your own. And then we'll go ahead and look at another one that's a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. Okay, so hopefully you guys had enough time if you pause this video to work through this problem. And so uh, here I see a central carbon. So I'm going to summarize what's attached to that central carbon besides, uh, or without talking about the, the next carbon over. And so here in this case, I just have a CH3. Okay. And so if I summarize what I see here, I have a CH2. If I summarize what's going on here, I have another CH2. And then last but not least, if I summarize what's going on in the tail end of this expanded structure, I see a CH3. Okay. And so if you guys combine this together, you get CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. Okay. So this would be an acceptable form of the condensed structure. Um, now, uh, notice that the middle part, we have two consecutive CH2s. And so if you want, you can further reduce this. You can condense the condensed structure by combining um, items that are repetitions of itself, but they have to be consecutive. And so let's go ahead and take a look at um, what this would look like. And so we can go ahead and combine the consecutive CH2s in the middle of this condensed structure by simply putting in parentheses and then writing the quantity using a subscript. So here we would have CH3, parentheses, CH2, because this is the unit okay, that is being repeated, and it is being repeated twice. And then we're going to go ahead and put in the last CH3. Okay. So this is also another way that you guys can represent the uh, condensed structure of this specific molecule. And so um, I need to show you guys both forms uh, just because you might see this form 
on like the back of a food label or something, right? Um, and so when we talk about plastics, we'll probably be using uh, this, this form where it kind of like repeats repeating units within that compound. All right. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a molecule. It's a little bit more complex. Um, then we'll take a look at one more and see if we can draw or write its condensed structure. And so in the previous uh, examples, everything is pretty linear. Uh, everything is more or less carbons and hydrogens. So they're pretty simple for us to um, write the condensed structure for. But these organic compounds, these organic molecules are very complex in, in nature. Um, and so we need to learn how to write the condensed structure for them. And so in this example, there's a linear portion, but there's also carbons that are branching upwards. Uh, now, if you rotate this 180 degrees, uh, the two carbons that are branching upwards can branch downwards. So remember, all of these molecules are three-dimensional, so you can rotate them any which way. Uh, however, the format is still the same. Um, we're just going to change it ever so slightly to make sure that we're representing the connections correctly. Um, so I'll probably just try to wedge it up here. And so uh, this section right here, I'm, I know from uh, you know the previous work that we've done, I'm going to summarize that as CH3. Maybe I shouldn't draw the arrow too. <clears throat> So here we have a CH3, here we have a CH2, and so when we hit this branch point, uh, what we're summarizing is only the carbon and the number of hydrogens it's attached to, because remember each carbon is being represented separately from each other, um, and so for the, this branching point, I'm going to go ahead and do this in a different color, maybe red. I'm going to go ahead and just summarize this portion, and that's going to be a carbon hydrogen. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and continue forward, and I'll talk about the branching point in just a second. So here I'm going to represent this as another carbon and hydrogen. And so here I'm representing this as another carbon hydrogen. Here I'm going to represent this as another carbon hydrogen. Uh, and so if we're looking at this triple bond, um, notice that this triple bond only has a carbon and no hydrogens. And so we're just going to go ahead and put in just summarize it like how you see it, just a carbon. Same thing here, just a carbon. Um, oh, actually, no, sorry, let me take it back. And so for this last carbon, um, I'll do this in blue. Notice this carbon is bonded to one hydrogen, and so this is a CH. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to write the condensed form for everything that we've circled so far. And so here I have um, a CH3 on the left-hand side. So I'm going to start from the left to the right. So I have a CH3. Okay, that's this guy. And then the next thing is CH2 from left to right. And then the one in red is just going to be CH. Okay. And then next one in blue, this guy right here, it's going to be another CH. Okay. Now, if you notice this CH, there's a double bond. And whenever you guys are uh, 
if you whenever you guys encounter a double bond or a triple bond, um, your condensed structure should communicate that to the reader. And so this double bond and this triple bond cannot be removed or ignored in your condensed structure. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw a, that double bond right after the hydrogen. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and write uh, the next piece, which is another carbon and hydrogen. Okay. And so let me just add in some arrows. So this carbon and hydrogen is this guy right here. This carbon and hydrogen is going to be this guy right here. And so the next item is going to be that CH2. And then if you look, we just have a carbon. And then that carbon has a triple bond. So we're going to put one, two, three. And then the last thing that we see, and so the last thing that we see is the CH. And so right now I'm just merely building the the um, the carbons that are you know con kind of consecutive to each other. Uh, they're called the parent chain. So I'm building my parent chain right now. And so I'm going to just check my work. And so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. I have one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight carbons. And I have a triple bond between the last two. And I have a double bond in the middle of, or between carbon four and carbon five. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then uh, between the fourth and the fifth, I have a double bond. Okay. And so um, basically, if you guys are looking at this more complex example, we're just, the only thing that we're doing is we're, we're removing the single bonds and we're summarizing the carbons and hydrogens in order of their metallic character. So remember, carbon is more metallic than hydrogen. And so that's why carbons are typically written first. All right, so hopefully you guys under, understand or understood how I got to this point. And so the reason why I'm erasing some of this stuff is because um, I need to start s depicting this, uh, the two carbons that are you know, branching up on the third carbon, the, the carbon that I circled in red. Okay, and so um, if you guys look at this, the, the circle in red, this guy right here, notice that there are two carbons that's attached to it. And so to depict this, and I'm just going to go ahead and erase this part right here. I don't think I need this. Um, and so if this is for now, uh, going from left to right, one, two, three, one, two, three. On the third carbon, this is where we have a branching point. And we can summarize that branching point by the number of carbons that's on it. So the first thing that I see is a CH2. And so I'm going to go ahead and write CH2. And then the last thing that I see is CH3. Okay. So uh, very similar to the parent chain, I'm just going to go ahead and write CH3. Um, and so that's pretty much it for the condensed structure of this molecule. Okay. So definitely a lot of scribbles, definitely a lot of circles, um, but Hopefully you guys can see how I was able to create 
uh, my condensed structure from this expanded uh, structure. All right, so we're going to go ahead and look through one more example before we start talking about the skeletal structure. And so um, the reason why I left this one blank um, <clears throat> is because you guys need to know how to kind of fill in uh, the number of hydrogens for each carbon or the number of hydrogens for a specific heteroatom, and the list continues. And then so once we fill in this uh, the, once we fill in the, this structure with the correct number of hydrogens so that each carbon can follow the octet rule, then we're going to go ahead and write its condensed structure. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and start on the carbon on the left, uh, just because I read from left to right. When we start naming organic compounds, um, that perspective will change based on the priority of the substituent, but that's for another lecture. Uh, and so if you look at this carbon, um, this carbon that's on the right, um, maybe I'll go ahead and just erase it and put in blue for now. It's currently bonded to this carbon. And so the carbon that's on the left in blue needs to follow the octet. So right now it only has one, two electrons. So since it needs eight, uh, we're going to fill in the number of electrons that it needs um, by adding in hydrogens. And so since we need eight and we only have two, that means we need three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. And remember that one bond represents two electrons. So that means that there needs to be one hydrogen here, hydrogen and another hydrogen. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at <clears throat> the carbon that has a branched carbon chain. And so the carbon in pink. And so notice that this carbon currently is bonded to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so we do not need to put any hydrogens on the carbon uh, that I just drew in pink. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and go with green. So for the next carbon, I have... One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so currently that carbon has six valence electrons. And so for it to fulfill the octet, we need another set of electrons. And that's going to be filled in with hydrogen. Okay. So overall, if you look at the carbon in green, notice that we have four lines. Two lines are single bonds. The other two lines are double bonds. Okay, so this is the double bond. These two are the single bonds. But in total, we have four covalent bonds on that green carbon, and therefore we'll have um, eight valence electrons on that carbon. Um, and so the next carbon, I'll do this in red. It has one, two, three, four, five, six. And so we need eight. So to fill in that eight, I need another covalent bond. And I need to fill that in with a hydrogen. Okay. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so um, I need to start recycling my colors. My For oxygen, remember that oxygen innately has one, two, three, four electrons. Remember these electrons are lone pairs. 
And so therefore we have four electrons already on this oxygen. Now if we look to the left of that oxygen, we have five, six. And then if we look to the right of that oxygen, we have seven, eight electrons. And so um, it all the oxygen already has the correct number of uh, valence electrons, so we do not need to put in any more hydrogens. Okay. And so looking at the carbon um, right to the right of the oxygen, I'll do this in pink again, uh, notice that it has one, two, three, four, five, six, and since it only has six valence electrons, that's going to prompt us to draw one more um, bond with a hydrogen. Okay? That will fulfill its octet rule. Now for the chlorines, I'll just do this one in green. For the chlorines, uh, remember chlorine is a halogen. And halogens have how many lone pairs? So if you said three, you're correct. So halogens innately has three lone pairs. And so each lone pair contains two electrons. So we have six electrons in total for chlorine. And so for chlorine, I have six uh, electrons and then this bond is going to represent the seven and the eighth electron for that chlorine. So the same pattern holds true for the chlorine that's on the right of the pink carbon or the carbon in pink. We have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, valence electrons. And the seven to eighth is gonna come from that covalent bond between chlorine and the carbon. Okay. Um, and so let's look at this red carbon. Notice that there's a branching point. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do this in orange. So this carbon uh, currently has one, two, three, four. And so for it to fulfill its electron, it needs two more bonds so that it can get all eight valence electrons. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll do this one in blue. <clears throat> so the carbon at the bottom Uh, notice it has one bond, so that's two electrons already. And so since, since it's attached to nothing else, we're going to assume that everything else has a hydrogen. It's, that carbon is bonded to hydrogens. So one, two, three, four. So this is the third and the fourth. Five and six. Seven and eight valence electrons. Um, and so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the carbon that's um, on the top of the pink. So I'll do this in one in purple. And so this carbon has, uh, let me erase this. One, two, three, four, five, six electrons. And so to fulfill its octet, it needs one more hydrogen. All right, and so um, my question to you is, let's just say that these carbons, I'm gonna go ahead and depict these carbons in blue. How many hydrogens do these carbons in blue need to have so that it can fulfill its octet rule? Now, if you said three, you're absolutely correct. And so currently, this carbon has one, two uh, electrons attached to it. So to fulfill its, its octet, it needs three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, okay? And so all of these will be attached to a hydrogen. So same thing for the carbon that's on the right, of the carbon in purple. So we have one, two. To fulfill its octet, we need three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And those electrons are gonna come from hydrogen. 
And so overall, we've um, created this organic compound, whatever this organic compound is, might not exist in real life, but that's okay. And so now that we've um, created the expanded structure of this organic compound, we're gonna go ahead and translate th this colorful molecule into the condensed structure. And so I'm gonna to try to be a little bit more organized in this example. And I'm just gonna randomly start naming these carbons. Um, for now it's random because we haven't talked about rules yet. Uh, but as we progress through this chapter, uh, the numbering of the carbons is very specific. So I'm just gonna name this, number this one, two, three, four, five, six. And then seven, eight, okay, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. Okay. So um, I, you guys can number this any which way. Uh, when you're go when you're going from expanded to condensed structure, there's no specific rule in your numbering. Just number it for yourself. And so um, it looks like I'm going to I'm I'm going to go ahead and build everything in the middle first. Uh, so that way, once everything in the middle is built, then I can just start attaching nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen onto what I've already built from my condensed structure. Okay. And so notice that for branch structures, we cannot ignore that single bond. So this is your, your branching point. And so you need to tell the reader where the branching point is, uh, if there is one in your organic compound. And you also need to make sure that you include all the double bonds and triple bonds. So really the only thing that we're in excluding are the single bonds that is not a branching point. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and start with quote unquote carbon number one. Okay, so I'm going to put carbon one here. And carbon one is going to represent this thing that I just circled. So I'm going to summarize that as H3. So let's look at carbon two. So carbon two has no hydrogens, but it does have a branching point. And so that's gonna depict carbon 11. Okay. And so I'll leave that for now. Uh, so the next carbon that I see is carbon three. So notice that between carbon two and carbon three, there's a double bond. And carbon three has a hydrogen. Now, if you look at carbon four, notice that carbon four has one hydrogen. And it also has a branching point. And that branching point is going to represent carbon 9 and will build carbon 10 as we continue. Okay. All right, so now that we're done with carbon uh, 4, we'll, we're going to go to oxygen 5. And so here in this case, I'm just going to simply put an oxygen. So this is the first time that we've kind of come across a heteroatom that's inside our organic structure. So we're just gonna simply put an O, okay. Uh, and then the next number is carbon six. Okay. And so carbon six has one hydrogen
And then notice that it's attached to two heteroatoms. It's attached to Cl7 and Cl8. Now, very similar to anything that repeats, right? So if we have a repetition, we can go ahead and summarize it in parentheses um, and then put a subscript to represent the quantity of how many times that substance has been repeated. And so you'll notice that they're both the same, right? Chlorine and chlorine. And so I can go ahead and put in uh, you know, Cl2 at the very end. So that'll tell me that um, there are two chlorines that's attached to this carbon. Okay. So now that we've built um, the, the main chain, so to speak, we're going to go ahead and uh, build the branching points. And so for carbon 9 and carbon 10, which is in orange and blue, I'm going to go ahead and summarize what's going on in carbon 9. Um, so here, notice that carbon 9 has two hydrogens. So I'm going to simply put CH2. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extend this branching point just so it doesn't get away, doesn't not get in the way of the numbering. And then, uh, so this is carbon nine. And so carbon 10 has three hydrogens and I'm just going to add that in next to carbon nine. So I've basically built my branching point for 9 and 10. Now I'm going to go ahead and do it for 11, 12, and 13. And so you'll notice that for 11, carbon 11, we have one hydrogen. For carbon 12 and carbon 13, we have a CH3. And so, um, <clears throat> we're simply going to put in CH3 and CH3. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So we're going to put in CH3 and CH3. So to represent the CH3s on either side of carbon 11. Now, um, sometimes you guys will see this. As a repetition of two CH3s. And so if I erase all the numbering <clears throat> This would be my skeletal structure. I'm sorry, not my skeletal structure. This is my condensed structure of this molecule. Okay. All right, and so um, feel free to, to, to pause this video and maybe redo this one on your own. Um, it's a little bit more complex, a little bit more complicated, but hopefully if you guys just break it down piece by piece, carbon by carbon, uh, and then just slowly build up your condensed structure. Um, you guys will, uh, you know, get it in one shot and you guys won't make um, that many mistakes. And so another thing that you guys can do is just check your work, check to make sure that the number of carbons, number of hydrogens, number of heteroatoms are, uh, are correct uh, between the expanded and the um, condensed structure. Okay. And so um, this is the reason why I numbered all of my carbons and heteroatoms. Uh, I didn't number my hydrogens. They're, they're the things that are like being added to it. Uh, and so I numbered my carbons and I numbered my heteroatoms 
just to kind of keep me in check uh, as I go from expanded into um, the condensed structure. Okay. Now, <clears throat> uh, before we move on to the next topic, um, I just want to do one more. And I want you guys to, uh, to notice that we're going to, how do I say this? So from here, we went from expanded to condensed. You guys need to know how to go from condensed to expanded structure. Okay. So we're just going to do like one example or maybe two. So we're going to go from condensed to expanded. So we're working backwards now. So if you guys were given a condensed structure, you guys should be able to draw the expanded structure from it. Um, and so for example, if we have CH3, uh, CH, CH2, CH, CH3, CH3, CH3. Okay. <clears throat> and so if I gave you guys this on your exam, you should be able to draw the expanded structure of this condensed um, structure. And so um, this is pretty simple. If we work from left to right, uh, if we I guess we should organize. So let's just say this one, two, three, four, five, and then six, and then seven. And so if I number my carbons in an arbitrary manner, um, I'll have like a, a point of reference, so to speak, when I'm going from condensed to expanded. And so if I look at carbon one, notice that carbon one is attached to three hydrogens. So carbon one is gonna have one, two, three hydrogens. And since carbon one is next to carbon two, and that carbon two has a branching point and one hydrogen, I'm going to put in carbon two, one hydrogen, and a branching point for carbon six. And carbon six has three hydrogens, so I'm gonna put one, two, three hydrogens, okay? And so carbon three, which is next to carbon two, is, uh, Carbon three has two hydrogens. And so I'm gonna put a CH and another CH. And so the next carbon, carbon four, notice that it has one hydrogen that's bonded to it. And it also has a branching point to carbon seven that has three hydrogens attached to it. Last but not least, I have carbon five. And carbon five has three hydrogens attached to it. And so overall, this is going to be the expanded structure from this condensed chemical formula. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so what you guys can do is, uh, you know, go through the problems that we've done, um, whether you guys are going from the expanded structure to condensed or condensed to the expanded structure, and see if you guys can replicate them um, on your own. Okay. All right, so now that we've learned um, how to write the condensed structure, we're gonna go ahead and learn how to write the skeletal structure. 
And it, it really, the skeletal structure is what we're going to be using for the remainder of this course. It's not to say that the condensed structure is um, not pertinent. Uh, there are some, for example, if you guys are on Google on your own and you guys come across the, the condensed structure, in your mind you should be able to see that the condensed structure is this, right? This is the expanded structure. Um, and so for the skeletal structure, uh, it actually does away with the hydrogens completely. Um, and the only thing that it depicts is the number of bonds, the number of carbons, and the number of heteroatoms that's attached to it. And so um, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of examples. Actually, not a couple. We're going to take a look at several. So if we're taking a look at this expanded structure, notice that we have two carbons. And so when we write the skeletal structure for this compound, the carbons are going to serve as like the foundation for the skeletal structure. And what we're going to do is we're going to ignore all of these hydrogens in the skeletal structure. And so if you kind of summarize all that up, you just simply have carbon and carbon, right? Now the skeletal structure does one thing that's really cool. It actually uh, also erases these carbons. And the only thing that we get is a line. And this is your skeletal structure. This line, this singular line that I just drew, is supposed to represent all of this. Okay? And so um, you might be like, oh wow, what just happened? Um, and so notice how we go from the expanded structure, which, take, which takes a long time to draw, to something that I just drew in like one second. And this, this line that I just drew is supposed to represent this whole item that I circled in blue. And so uh, let's, let's go backwards to kind of think about what this means. Um, so let's just say that we have, for instance, this. Okay. Um, so we just have, I don't know, a squiggly line. Um, and so the squiggly line is actually representing butane. Uh, and so how can I get that information just by looking at the structure? Well, if you recall, this skeletal structure just represents that, that bond that was left over after that carbon and hydrogen was just kind of crossed off. And so what that's telling us is that this point, let me do this in a different color, uh, this endpoint and this endpoint represents this carbon and this carbon. And if you guys recall, each carbon wants to have four covalent bonds around it. Well, this carbon only has one covalent bond. And so for it to fulfill its octet, we have one, I'll do this in a different color, oops. we'll have one, two, three imaginary hydrogens. Okay, so hydrogens are excluded. Okay, however, this is what you guys need to see in your mind. Okay. Now, if you look at this carbon, notice that it also has one covalent bond that's attached to another carbon, which represents this carbon right here. And so since each carbon needs to have, or fulfill the octet rule, needs to have four covalent bonds around it. And so there's an invisible one, two, three hydrogens that's not drawn. However, um, well actually not however, so you guys need to keep in mind the number of hydrogens that's ignored per skeletal, per vertice in the skeletal structure. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this, um, this image that I drew, this butane. 
So this butane has one, two, three, four carbons. Okay. And the reason why it is zigzag is because a carbon is tetrahedral. And remember, the tetrahedral, the bond angle for a tetrahedral is 109.5 degrees. And so this is the reason why we must draw this in zigzag. It's to represent the relative bond angle, even though it's not exact in the way that we depict it. However, the bond angle is there in spirit, if you will. Now, let's think about how many hydrogens each of these uh, carbons that's represented as a vertice have. So this carbon is going to have one, two, three hydrogens. Okay. That's been ignored. Why? Because this carbon has one, two, three, four covalent bonds that it requires for its octet to be full. In other words, eight electrons. Okay. Now, how many hydrogens do you think this carbon has? Now, if you said two invisible hydrogens, then you're correct. How many hydrogens does this carbon have? How many invisible hydrogens does this carbon have? And so once again, if you said two, then you guys are absolutely correct. So this one has two invisible hydrogens. Now, what about this carbon at the very end? How many invisible hydrogens does it have? So if you said three invisible hydrogens, then you're correct. Okay. And so overall, these zigzags uh, is going to represent the number of carbons and whatever is not shown, um, there's hydrogens that's, that's implied there. And the number of hydrogens is equal to the number of bonds that carbon is missing to fulfill its octet, okay? So remember that one carbon needs four covalent bonds, whether it's a single, double, or triple bond. So if it only has one covalent bond, then it needs three more covalent bonds. And those three covalent bonds will represent the invisible hydrogens. So that is the, um, the, the concept behind a skeletal structure. We're ignoring all of these hydrogens, and we're ignoring the carbons, and we're only really looking at the line, this bond, um, because it's the number of bonds and the number of uh, you know, vertices that will tell us how many carbons that organic compound will have. All right, so let's go ahead and do another example. So here we have three carbons. And so how many um, vertices will we have in our structure? And that'll be three, okay? And so we have one, two, three carbons. And I'm gonna go ahead, and the moment you put down your pen or pencil, that is carbon number one, okay? So that's one two, three. And if you want, you can go ahead and kind of bubble it in for now, uh, just to help you remember that there are three carbons in that molecule. And so notice that I have three hydrogens that I'm ignoring at this point. I have two hydrogens that I'm ignoring on this vertice and I have 
three hydrogens that I'm ignoring in this vertice. However, me drawing my organic compound like this fully represents this expanded structure. Pretty cool, right? All right, so here, um, how many carbons do we have and how many vertices do we need in our skeletal structure? Okay, so it's four. So we have one, two, three, four to represent one, two, three, four. So connect them and we're done. Now let's look, a, um, let's look at a more complicated compound. So how can we draw the skeletal structure of this um, molecule? So since this one is a little bit more complex, I'm gonna go ahead and start numbering these carbons arbitrarily. So I'll put a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, okay? And then I have this as nine and I have this as 10. And so the moment you put, remember we're ignoring all of the hydrogens, right? And so the moment you put your pen or pencil down, that is carbon number one. And then I'm gonna zigzag to carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, now notice on carbon four, I start my double bond. And so carbon five needs to uh, go down. So this is carbon five. And I need to have a double bond between carbon four and carbon five. Okay. All right, so to continue, I need to do carbon six. Notice it's a single bond. And then when I hit, so this is carbon six. And so when I hit carbon seven, notice that I have a triple bond. Now, if you guys recall, triple bond is 180 degrees. And so you guys cannot zigzag up, okay? Uh, if you zigzag up, you're telling me that the conformation is not, the bond angle, excuse me, is not 180. And so when you hit carbon seven, you guys need to continue drawing it downward. So that's representing the 180 degree angle according to molecular and, and uh, electron geometry. And finally, we're gonna move, to, move on to carbon eight and carbonate, oops, sure. Carbonate will have that carbon, and then notice that there's gonna be that hydrogen at the very end. And if you guys recall, we're ignoring hydrogens. And so to represent carbonate, it's simply this, okay? So this tail end, is carbonate. And we know that this tail end is already attached to one, two, three, or already has one, two, three bonds. And so therefore it's implied that there's, only going, there's going to be one hydrogen on this eighth carbon, but we're not drawing it in because we're ignoring all hydrogens. Okay. So hopefully you guys um, <clears throat> kind of understood that. All right, so we're not done yet because we have a branching point at three, at carbon three. And so notice at carbon three, uh, we branch off to nine and 10. And so you guys can either put it up or put it down. It doesn't really matter. Remember these are uh, three dimensional molecules and it can rotate, single bonds can rotate any which way. 
Um, they have 360 degrees of rotation. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And so um, notice that in carbon-9, we have a bond that's going up. And then we have an another bond to carbon-10. Okay. And that'll be it. And so if I were to clean up this organic molecule, I would just have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight. And then on the third, uh, I have one, oops, I have one, two carbons. So notice that my translation, I put this one down just to demonstrate the point that the branching can either be up or down, doesn't really matter. But the main point is that the correct number of carbons has been placed. And so if you want to put in dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, just to help remind you of the number of carbons that you've put down between the expanded and the skeletal, that's fine. Um, and then there's going to be nine and it's going to be 10. All right, so uh, we went over to something that's pretty easy and simple, then we just kind of like dove right into something that's a little bit more difficult. But hopefully you guys, uh, you know, through this example, this through this more complex example, you understand, oh, wait, hold on, I forgot a double bond here. Okay, there he goes. Um, you guys understand how to draw the skeletal structure of something that's a little bit more complex. All right, so here in this case, um, we're going to go ahead and draw the skeletal structure just on this molecule. But before we do that, we're going to go ahead and draw in the hydrogens. And so, <clears throat> so here we have one, two, three, okay. then four, then one, two, three, four, so nothing there. One, two, three, so there needs one more. One, two, three, so I need four. And then I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, actually, sorry. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so that's good. Here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then f at the bottom, I have one, two, three, four, five, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So hydrogen's here. Then here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. And so we have hydrogens here as well. <clears throat> All right, so um, last thing that we need to do is just fill in the hydrogens at the top. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, one, two is right here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the expanded structure um, for this organic compound uh, with the hydrogens drawn in. So what we're going to do is we're going to summarize all of this expanded structure into the skeletal structure. And so I'm going to go ahead and start organizing my work by um, numbering my carbons. I'm just going to number it arbitrarily. So one, two, three, four, 
and then five, six, seven, eight. Okay. The only thing I'm not numbering is my hydrogens because remember it's ignored. Uh, so eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with carbon one. So this guy right here to this guy right here. So that's one, two. So the moment you draw that line, you have one, two carbons. And then on the second carbon, you have a double bond to the third. Okay, so I'm right here now. And then I'm gonna to go to the fourth, so I need to go up. And then if you look at the fifth, um, so this is my fourth carbon. My fifth has to be an oxygen. And remember that the if you look at uh, oxygen, it has two lone pairs and two single bonds. So in terms of electron geometry, that's still tetrahedral. And so because it's tetrahedral, we want to mimic the 109.5. And we're gonna go ahead and put in those two lone pairs like this. Okay. And so now that we've brought this up, this is going to represent carbon six. Okay, so this is one, two, three, Three, let me. Four, five, six. Okay. So now that we're at carbon six, we're going to go to eight, seven, and eight. So the seventh is a heteroatom. And so this heteroatom, very similar to oxygen, needs to be um, written. Right, it cannot be represented as a vertice. And the dots that I'm drawing around it is representing the number of lone pairs. And then the eighth item is um, another oxygen. Now this oxygen, which is a heteroatom, it's covalently bonded to that hydrogen. And so we're only ignoring the hydrogens that belong to the carbon. And so I'm going to go ahead and write that hydrogen for the oxygen. Um, and so you guys will learn very soon that OH is going to be your alcohol functional group. So this is the reason why you guys need to just write in the hydrogens for heteroatoms, but not for carbons. That's ignored. All right, so it looks like on carbon-4 I have a branching point. Um, and since my, my carbon-4 the way that I drew this is pointing up. I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure the nine and 10 is pointing up. It doesn't really matter. It can be pointed up or pointed down. Um, and so for number nine, you have this vertice. And then for number 10, it's just gonna be that last point. Okay. Now here we have um, uh, this V-looking structure. And so it's on carbon-2. So on carbon-2, we have that central carbon, carbon-11. And then it branches off to two CH3s. This is carbon-12. It's carbon-13. Cool. And so um, we pretty much translated this expanded structure into a skeletal structure that looks like this. Now, if I clean up my work and I, if I don't show my numbers uh, and my little dots that I drew, I'm going to have this as my result. Oops. Okay. 
<clears throat> so this is my skeletal structure for this organic molecule. All right. Um, so hopefully by going through these examples, um, you guys are able to understand how to translate uh, expanded structures into skeletal structures. And so um, I do encourage you guys to kind of replay some parts of this video and see if you guys can go from the skeletal structure to the expanded Maybe I'll just do one example for that. So I'm just going to